here today. And um, I suppose, what you know, that just speaks so highly of psychology as a subject and how popular it is. Um, I, I, I know that psychology is one of the most popular degree courses. And I also know that clinical psychology, which is, which is my specialism, is, is also an incredibly popular career choice. Uh, just out of interest, is anyone here, could you put your hands up if you are considering clinical psychology as a career? Wow, that's so many of you, that's amazing. Okay, great. Well, hopefully you'll find this interesting then. So I'm going to talk a bit about psychology, about clinical psychology, how I got into it, what the training was like, and um, where I've gone since, I guess. So um, hopefully it'll be interesting for you. And then there'll be an opportunity for five minutes at the end for you to ask any questions. But also we've got the um, questions and answer panel session at the end of the day. So, so make sure you sort of store questions. And I think there's a way of doing it, isn't there? And I don't know what it's called. It's Slido. Slido. Anyway, hopefully you'll know what that is. Um, so, so because psychology and clinical psychology is so daunting, it's, it's because it's so popular, it's so daunting. So I suppose, um, I suppose you've all heard about how competitive it is to get in. And, and that is such a horrible thing to be told, isn't it? Oh, God, it's so competitive. I know that I, um, I, I became a psychology student in my mid-30s. So I went into it very late in life. Uh, I had a lot of other life experiences that I'll talk to you a little bit about later. Um, but I remember when I was doing my BSc in psychology and I was in my second year, I went to a careers fair at my university, which was the University of Sussex, great university. And I went up to this desk where they didn't, they didn't have clinical psychology um, doctorate training as an option at the university, but I was just interested in clinical psychology or, or whatever else there was. So I went to this careers fair and I went up to this this man who um, was a lecturer at the university, and he and I said to him, look, I'm interested in what postgrad courses you have here. And he said, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to be a clinical psychologist, but, but I'm also interested in what else there is. And he just looked at me, and he went, I can tell, just looking at you, you wouldn't be able to make it. <laughs> and honestly, I've had that said to me so many times when I was an undergrad that there's a type, that there's a type that gets in. It's so competitive and there's a type and you're not the type. I, don't, I, I kind of know what the type they're talking about is, but actually it's a lot of nonsense. So I just, I just want to really encourage you from the off today that whoever you are, if you're passionate about something, if you've got a belief in yourself and a, and a passion for the subject, you go for it. You know, don't let anyone tell you that you're not good enough. Um, so that's my first thing that I'd like to say. Um, so I think being someone who isn't the type, whatever that is, is a great thing. <laughs> now I know that. I know that being different, having something that's a bit more diverse about your route in. So obviously it was, it was partly because I was older. I was in my mid-30s at the time. I didn't actually start training until I was 39. Um, that would have been part of it. I was also a single parent. That was part of it. I also was probably, you know, right on the breadline. I didn't, I didn't have any money. I had two young children who were dependent on me and I worked as a cleaner while I was doing my psychology degree. So I wasn't the type. But, but actually, of course, I was the type. What the type is, someone who's good at your subject and is passionate about people and is curious about people and wants to learn and, 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 and just, just develop as a person and help other people develop too. So... Um, so that was me. So I suppose thinking about you, you're sitting here today, you're thinking about your careers, what will make you a good psychologist? You really need to know this and start digging deep and thinking about it. So I'm assuming you're interested in the subject, you're passionate about psychology, that's why you're here. But what will make you a good psychologist? In particular, what will make you good at working with people, if that's what you want to do? And um, I suppose as, as a clinical psychologist, what's really important is that you are someone who can work and relate to a really wide range of people, so you can connect with people. You've got to be a bit of a problem solver, really, so you've got to be able to look at people and, and be able to apply all that theory that you're learning as an undergrad, all that theory that you learn, and be able to apply it to people and... and and actually make us make a start of formulating what their difficulties are, what's caused their difficulties, and what might help. Um, 
there's, there's a whole, the, the whole range of people that you will work with as a clinical psychologist is quite amazing. I mean, there's, you've, you've got to have a, an ability, I suppose there's a bit of resilience really that's going to be needed in you because you're going to be working with potentially people who've got attachment difficulties, people who have difficulties in their relationships, people who might have really bizarre beliefs, all sorts of mental health difficulties. You, um, you will be working with people who've had a lot of loss, potentially, maybe who are terrified of death. That's something that comes up a lot. You know, who isn't? <laughs> but, but, as, uh, but where that really tips people into not being able to function anymore because they're so frightened of dying. So there's, there's such a huge amount of, of life and stuff that gets thrown at you when you're a clinical psychologist. You never know what you're going to get every day. Um, I think now I'm pretty, un I think I'm pretty unshockable, but there's always more to learn, obviously. Um, you're, you're, you also don't just work with individuals. You'll be working with, sometimes with teams. Um, you might be working with the person, the, the team around the person. So if it's a child, you could be working with a school. You could be working um, with the family. If, if it's a patient in a hospital, you could be working with all the staff to help them understand that person better. So there's a lot of indirect working, which I, I really enjoy. Um, and there's, it, the great thing about your training as a psychologist is that you, as a clinical psychologist, is that you get such a broad range of models that you are taught about and you get a chance to practice in. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach. You really are um, taught to sort of think holistically about a person and and uh, help to understand a person and what might what approach might be best for them. Um, you are going to have to be quite resilient. I keep using that word. That's my speciality, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. In terms of sometimes you can be a bit of a lone voice when you're working. So you might be working in a medical setting where um, where being a psychologist is is something that's a bit outside the box, and you've got to learn how to speak up and speak for your, your clients and, and really advocate for them to be thought of psychologically, not just as a, as a diagnosis. Um, and, and really, it's about how you apply all your learning, all your understanding to people. So all that stuff that you learn about, all the every single behavioral experiment that you've learned about, every single theory, every single study, how you can then bring that to life and make this helpful and real for people. It's, it's, actually, it's, it's something that I, I absolutely love. So I suppose you know, what's important is that at this stage in your journey, if, if you're thinking about psychology as a clinical psychology as a career, we'll, we'll talk about your application. But also, you need to be able to stay motivated in this, because it's a long old road ahead, potentially. And I, and I would say, really, part of being motivated is um, I like that quote about, from Buddha, which was uh, something, of, I can't actually remember what it was, but what I was going to say, which was similar, was be process focused, not destination focused. So really, you know, enjoy the fact that every day you're learning something. Don't get too caught up in the end destination, which is probably to be, a, you know, possibly to be a clinical psychologist. Who knows where this journey will take you? And, and actually, wherever it takes you, there, there will be some interesting times ahead, I'm sure. Um, you, you're going to really need to get your head around failure <laughs> because I think reframing failure is so important. We, we, um, I mean, people talk to me a lot. As a psychologist, people are often asking me, how can I become more confident? That's, you know, who doesn't want to be more confident? Actually, I, the way I think of confidence is it's not, a, it's not a personality trait. It's not something you're born with. It's not something you, you just dig deep into yourself and start believing in yourself more. I think it's about letting go of fear, failure, fear of failure. And because if you can actually let go of fear of failure, put yourself out there a bit more, then confidence, confidence will come. So it actually, if you see failure as an opportunity to learn, what can I learn from this stuff? What can I learn from where this went wrong? then, oh God, I mean, I, I've, loads of stuff's gone wrong in my life, loads of stuff. But actually, it's through the difficult times, it's through the failures, it's through the knockbacks, through that guy when he said to me, you're not the type to apply for clinical psychology, that, that's, that's what, that makes you that stuff, if you allow it to. It can be really hard to pick yourself up, but what could I learn from that? I'll tell you what I learned was that there's a need for diversity. There's a need for people who haven't followed the traditional route. There's, there's a need for that, to challenge that perception. So, so that's a good thing. Are you with me?
Yeah, lots of nods, good, good. <laughs> okay, and you're gonna need some grit as well. You know, whatever you do in life, whether it's clinical psychology, whether it's whatever career you wanna do, it's, it's gonna take a little bit of grit, a little bit of determination to get there. It doesn't mean you've gotta have grit and determination every single day, because that's not possible. But on the whole, having some grit and some, some um, faith in yourself and some faith in, in, in where you wanna go in life and that you're gonna get there eventually is absolutely crucial. Okay, let's move on. So thinking about your application, I think the stats are to get into clinical psychology, most people apply three times or something. That's quite, that's quite a lot, isn't it? There's a lot of opportunities for learning there, isn't there? A lot, of, a lot of opportunities for that. So I would say in your application, if you apply, your application needs to have a narrative that makes sense. So by that, what I mean is that, you know, We've all done probably jobs in different places or you, maybe you've, you've, you've had all sorts of different experiences or different hobbies that you've got. Make sure that it tells a story through your application. How have you got to where you are today and why does this make sense? Why has your experience been helpful to, to make you a good psychologist? How, what have you learnt? I mean, building up your clinical and research skills is really good. You know, most people have worked as a, an assistant psychologist for a year or two before they apply, and if you can, that's, that's really good. If you've, if you've been an author on a paper, a journal, that's, that's good too. I worked as a research assistant at the university when I was coming towards the end of my undergrad, uh, my third year. I, I did some, I started off as a volunteer re research assistant, and then I, I was taken on um, as an employee, which I think was, was really helpful, and I learned a lot. Um, but really, whatever you've got in your application, make sure it tells a story. So for me, as a mature student, I had a lot of work experience. I'd never been uh, an assistant psychologist. I'd, I'd not had that opportunity. I, I, I just didn't even think about it until I became a mature student and I decided I wanted to be a psychologist. So when I was 16, I, I decided I wanted to be a psychologist. I actually had a psychologist. I was, I was struggling a bit in my childhood. And I had a psychologist, and I, I loved this. This guy was so good. He was so helpful. And I thought, that's it. That's who I want to be. I want to be a clinical psychologist. And then I find out that you've got to go to university for God knows how many years, and, and it's really tough. And I just, just couldn't really face doing that. So I didn't. And I, I did my A-levels, and then I kind of dropped out and didn't go to university. And I... I got married really young, I had children, I, I did all that first. And then I, I, did, I did some other jobs and it was during that time that I really decided, oh, I, I like working with people, I really do love this. But in my application, many years later to become a psychologist, I, I, I knew I had to make that story make sense. It, I didn't want it to look like it was jarring, like well, who is this woman that suddenly at 36 she's decided she wants to be a psychologist? What, what is this? I, I needed it to make sense, because it made sense to me how I developed as a person. It made sense to me, so I, I had to make it make sense to the people who were reading my application form. And I made sure I, I kind of, just in the, in the brief sort of bits you get to write, I, I made sure I wrote what I'd learned in each of those sort of periods of time, in each of those jobs, and what I'd learned about people and what I'd learned about myself that would be helpful in my application. Your reflective skills, it's so important. If you can get those to shine through in your application form, I think that's really good. Um, so what's more important than what, you've than what you've done is what you've learnt from what you've done. Does that make sense? So, so really, you can have had the best work experience in the world, but if you can't describe it in a way that shows what you've learnt from that, it's, it's a little bit meaningless. So really being able to talk about what you learnt at that time, why will that make you um, a good applicant is, is really important. And I, and I thoroughly believe that no pain is ever wasted. And I know that I, as I said, I was a mature student. I didn't get into psychology till quite late. But I, um, and I, and I could have looked, well I did look at my life at the age of 35 and thought what a failure, what a mess. I had a failed marriage. Um, my marriage had been very violent towards me, so I, I, was, I was sort of a victim of a domestic abuse for 16 years. It was really, really difficult. And I, and I could, and I did think, oh, I'm all washed up at 35. And then there was that little spark of, do you know what? No, I'm not having that. I'm not having it. I'm going to make something of my life. And 
I look at, look across at all of you and I think you can make something of your life. It would be how wonderful to be just starting, just starting out in your career in psychology. I just think it's an absolutely great time to be getting involved. Um, and just believe that, that no failure is wasted. It's, it's an opportunity to learn. And I know that I would not be the psychologist I am today if I hadn't gone through all of that stuff in life. You know, if life had always been rosy, if I'd, everything had been handed to me on a plate and I'd been the type, whatever that is, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as good as a psychologist as I am. I wouldn't be as successful as I am. But I, it's taken me a long time to get to that point. And um, I... I, when I was training, I'll talk about training, but when I was training as a psychologist, often it felt like everybody else sort of just knew what to do and just had it together, and I felt like a real fraud. It's that imposter syndrome, and at times you think, I'm going to get found out, I'm not as good as everyone thinks I am, or I got that mark on that essay, but it was a fluke, or, you know, whatever it is, if you get accepted onto the clinical training program, it's really good because you get a salary, so you don't have to pay any fees, um, which is great. But you really are an employee of the NHS. So it's not like being a student at university, you know, when you've got your full time. So you've got, usually it's two days a week of lectures, so nine to five, and you've got to be there on time. And you, if you're late, you've got to explain yourself. If you have a day sick, you have to have a return to work interview. Well, I certainly did at my, at my university. This was at Surrey. I did my doctorate. Um, it's, it's, it's work. And then on the other three days a week, you're on a placement. So that's really good. But again, you're at work. So you're not, you don't really feel like a student, um, even though you're technically classed as a student. So you, you still get free council tax and that kind of stuff. is <laughs> very important. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it was great. I loved going through the clinical training process, but it was also incredibly challenging. I felt like I was on a really steep learning curve, trying to work out, you know, God, all this stuff that you have to learn. And then, you know, when I had my first live client that I was let loose on, it was like, oh, you're not seriously going to let me talk to this person on my own, are you? Um, but, but actually, it's, it's all good stuff, and, and you're being properly supervised, and, and you're being properly trained. So it's, it's all really, really good. But it's, it's a steep learning curve. And I know for myself, as a single parent, as a, a bit older than not everybody, there were, some, there were some other mature students on the course, um, but I was older than most people. And it did feel a bit hard at times. I still loved it. I loved, I loved every... No, that's not true. I didn't love every day. I love most days. <laughs> I love most days of it. Um, but it, was, it felt tough at times. When everyone else was going off to the bar afterwards, after a five, you know, 5 p.m., you're finishing your lectures, and they were all off to the bar, I was racing a two-hour commute back home to pick up my kids from a childminder's. So it was, it was tough, and I, and I often felt a bit separate, if I'm honest. Um, and I can't say that that was easy, because it wasn't. It was hard. But even in all of that, again, it helps. It's that feeling of, I know that I never want people to feel that being on the receiving end, if you like, or you know, being the client when um, they're seeing me as a psychologist, they will feel othered, that I'm somehow better than anybody else. And I think that's where your life experiences are so important to keep you grounded, your family, your, your successes, your failures, your difficult times, the bits of you that you're a bit, a bit ashamed of or the bits of you that you'd rather other people didn't know about, all of that stuff, it keeps you grounded. And it's really important that you still feel on a level with your clients, that, that you're not better than them. They're not, it's not them and us, that we don't have that sense of othering, but we, but we really do just feel that we're somebody who's been fortunate enough to be given the tools to help others. That's, that's how I think it's important to see it. I think um, being able to start, even now, thinking like a psychologist. So start to become your own psychologist, you know, like if you, or, you know, just if you see issues, it doesn't mean you go in and leap in and, and sort everybody out because you won't be popular. Um, but just, just starting to think, well, what could be going on here? Starting to be curious about people, starting to be curious about yourself is a really good starting place. Um, I know that when I, when I got, had my interview, so I got through, when I applied to Surrey University, just checking on time, when I got through to Surrey University, I, um, 
I was lucky that I, 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 went, I got invited to an exam. So that was really good, because on paper, I didn't look that great. I didn't, hadn't, hadn't been an assistant psychologist. I'd, I hadn't got any NHS experience. But I had, um, obviously, other life experience. But I was invited to an exam, and, and I was quite good in the exam. So I got through that. And then, um, and then I was invited to an interview. And in the interview, what's really important is that you can talk about what you've learned through your life experiences, what you've learned, what you can, you can apply some of your theoretical knowledge to real life experiences with people and with yourself. Okay. So when I was, when I was training, my doctoral research was in resilience. So I, that was always my interest. And the reason it was my interest was because, I was, as I've already said, I, I had had some difficult times in life. And lots of people had said to me, well, how come you've gone through all that and you've bounced back? And it, for me, it wasn't a case of bouncing back. It wasn't a case of just, you know, just being OK after all that stuff. It wasn't. It was a case of what have I learned through that really difficult stuff, and how can I create a new meaning in my life be because of what I've gone through? And you know, I, I, did, I actually did a TED talk a few years ago where I was asked to talk about resilience after I did my doctoral research. And, and it was, um, I, I shared this story in the talk, and it, it was when I was training, one of my supervisors said to me, well, we, I had a client who'd been in a violent relationship. And I said to my supervisor, look, I just need to make you aware that I'm really OK working with this client, but I was in a violent relationship too once. And, and I just think it's important that you know that. And are you OK with me still working with this client? And this supervisor said to me, um, oh, Jemima, I, I don't know what to think of you now. I always used to think of you as really clever and really together. And now I don't know what to think of you. It's, I was mind blown with his actual words. And I said, well, and I got all defensive. And I said, no, 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 it's fine. You know, that was a few years ago. And I'm, I'm over it now. And I'm OK. And I'm, I'm OK to work with this woman. And I went into this really defensive speech. And he said, OK, OK, well, we'll see how it goes. I'll, and kind of dismissed me. And it was only a couple of years later when I had a light bulb moment. And I thought, no, I don't need to apologize for that stuff. I'm not a good psychologist in spite of that. I'm a good psychologist because of that and what I learned through it. You know, yes, if I was still, if I was still really in the, in psychologically in it, of course that wouldn't be good, but I'm not and I've learned so much and that's to be applauded for any of you who've gone through difficult times. So that's what I think. So I, I did my, res, um, my resilience doctor, um, research all about how do you come with more resilient? So looking at it not as a trait, but as a process, what are the processes involved? And some of the processes that are involved are becoming more self-aware, having more meaning in life, a sense of belonging, um, acceptance of yourself. It's OK to not be OK, accepting your own vulnerability, more self-compassion and more assertiveness. OK, just a little bit about my career path, just so you can, if it's interesting. So I did, so I qualified when I was um, in 2013. 2013, yeah. And then I went straight into working in hospices. So it wasn't something I'd ever planned to. I'd always thought I'd work with children. That was my um, passion. But then I saw this job in a hospice, and I, and I went for the interview, and I just loved it there. It was, it was such a lovely way of working where it's very holistic. You don't have a set number of sessions. You can work with people for as long as they need it. Um, I worked with palliative care, so people who've got life-limiting illnesses, and I worked with people who are bereaved. Um, I became the, the lead for the bereavement service after about a year. Um, and I just really started to develop my skills in therapy, in, in also in leadership and in teaching and in managing a team. Um, I did a lot of teaching in that role, which was really good because I, I liked that. And I ended up doing quite a bit of speaking at different conferences, which led to me um, being asked to give a TED talk. And it was really after my TED talk that I got invited to do so much other stuff, which led me to leave that job, although I still do a lot of consultancy work for them, and start my own business. So I've just given you a little fortnight into my life. Um, this is a typical kind of week. So on a Monday, I might see clients in my clinic. So I, I hire a clinic in Brighton, where I live, um, with a range of mental health or stress-related difficulties. I also work um, on that day usually with elite sportsmen. So that's been a quite an interesting 
development that I've gone into working with some of the top um, sports people in the country, working with how they manage their stress, how they get their head in the game, how they, um, how they keep a work-life balance or not. Um, and, and that's been really fascinating, how they manage their fight or flight response while they're on the pitch. Um, so that's been good. So that's my Monday. And so when I, when I see, I might see four or five, five clients on a day, usually four. And in between each client, I'll write up, type up my notes about them. Um, I will check any emails and then see my next one. Um, on a Tuesday, I mean, it's not always like this, but this is pretty typical. On a Tuesday, I have a contract with an NHS trust in a hospice. That's the hospice I used to work in. So I go in as a contractor now just to help support the team, um, working with people, again, with limiting, life-limiting illnesses and their families. Um, on a Wednesday, I go to another hospice and I facilitate several supervision groups for different psychologists and counsellors who work there. Um, on a Thursday, oh yeah, Thursdays are nice, so I work in with homelessness on a Thursday, so I, that's something I've, I've just sort of got into after I set up my own company, where I, there's a lot of high turnover of staff with um, working with people who are homeless or um, at risk of homelessness, and staff find it really difficult, so I work a lot with the staff to help build their resilience, I run reflective practice groups, but I also teach um, resilience up and down the country for staff that work with homelessness. Um, and I also work with um, people, clients themselves who are homeless, helping them to build their resilience. Because often we find that you, you know, they might have been given a home, but actually psychologically they're not ready for a home and, and they really struggle with, with setting down roots in a home. And you know, for example, would never dream of putting their clothes in a wardrobe because it doesn't feel comfortable. They'd rather live out of a bin bag in their home. So it's, it's helping people to, to kind of shift their identity, if you like. And then a Friday, I might facilitate an all-day resilience workshop for, um, a different, for different audiences. Um, might be healthcare professionals or um, members of the public who want to know about resilience and how they can become more resilient. Um, week two, <laughs> my fortnight. Um, Monday to Wednesday, oh yeah, quite often I go away Monday to Wednesdays to to run a three-day residential course on how people can become more resilient when they're um, caring for somebody with dementia. So if they're somebody in their family has dementia, um, carers really often struggle. It's hard work, really hard work. And you know, there's that analogy of if um, if you're on an aeroplane and the oxygen mask falls down, you want to put your own oxygen mask on before you put it onto the person next to you. So I work with carers to help them to feel more resilient so that they can keep going and look after themselves in the process. Um, and then on a Thursday, I might work with the N an NHS trust again. Um, Fridays, maybe a half day stress management workshop for nurses or counselors. And I'll try and get home a bit early on the Friday afternoon. So that's my typical fortnight. Um, yeah, I mean, any, anyone got, I've probably finished a bit early actually. Anyone got any